here we go in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Audit Committee for Tuesday, June 15, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public until further notice in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to do also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Opens Meeting Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through live stream on BCPS web website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making or seconding a motion is applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Pasteur. Present. Ms. Rowe? Here. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joes? Absent. Ms. Jamison, thank you. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mc yes. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens? Present. Mr. Fletcher? Present. Ms. Manna? Present. Ms. Crew? Present. Mr. Strait? Present. Mr. Edwards? Present. Ms. Sample? Present. Mr. Spore? Present. Dr. Scriven? Mr. Saris? Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you. Our next item is opening remarks. I have no opening remarks. We're going to move right to reports. Our first item is the follow ups to the FY20 audits. And for that, I call on Ms. Manna. Good afternoon. Uh, this report, I'm I'm sorry, and we'll get Mr. Corns a chance to get that um, graphic up on the screen. While he's getting that up, I can give some background. When, whenever there are audits um, that have findings, we do a follow-up. So this representation is for school activity fund and procurement audits that were completed in fiscal year 2020. There were 22 that we completed. Three of them had no findings. So therefore, there were 19 schools that required a follow up that had at least one finding for us to look into. Um, of those 19 schools, eight of the schools had all findings resolved. Therefore, there were 11 schools that had unresolved findings, which this chart is a representation of. There was a total of 54 findings um, in all of the 22 schools that were completed. There were 40 or 54 findings, I'm sorry, that were needed to be looked at for the 19 schools. 41 of them were resolved, which represents the 76%. There was seven um, findings that were partially resolved, which re represents the 13%. Um, two findings or 4% were not resolved and four findings or 7% were labeled as could not be determined. The could not be determined and five of the seven partially resolved were all related to school activity fund accounts that had idle funds where we identified them as having a balance but have not been used at least for a, a year during the period of review. So during the follow up, we were looking to see if those funds had since been used. 
However, due to the pandemic and the school closures and the limited activity and school activity funds, uh, it was difficult to, to say whether or not these funds were used. They, they needed more time to spend these funds. Therefore, they were labeled as could not be determined or partially resolved. The partially resolved uh, schools were because there were some accounts that they were able to clarify and to to spend the, um, the money as intended. Um, so that was the majority of the opening of the unresolved issues at these follow ups was related to that type of finding. Um, so th that that's pretty much all for the 2020 follow up audits. Um, this current year in fiscal year 21, we issued um, 10 school activity fund peak card audits. So in the future, we will do follow ups for those as well. Eight of them will need a follow up too because two had no findings. So that was just a recap of what we did for this year. Any questions, committee members? Any questions? Miss Manna, I have a question. Yes, sir. I'm okay. sorry. Excuse me, Miss Rowe, go ahead, please. I didn't get unmuted quick enough. Um, when you have situations where you could not determine or they're not resolved, do you go back then and do another follow up? What we decided to do for this year, we do have them identified. So at a later date, when school activity funds does have more activity, we will go in and take a look at them to see if uh, they have uh, started using those funds as intended. Typically, we do not do a follow up to a follow up. What we do is just uh, the executive director in the community soup of the school is um, included in these reports. So we have them, uh, we alert them to make sure they monitor to make sure that the principal is doing what needs to be done for the unresolved issues. But in this case, because of the circumstances, we do have them flagged and we will take a look at them when it's appropriate. OK, do you ever have a situation where? You have findings and follow ups and and the findings um, aren't resolved and then you do another audit and it's the same schools with the same findings that weren't resolved the first time. What's your protocol? Should something like that occur? That has happened in the past and typically we do get the community soup and or the executive director involved more that in that, those cases. OK, so. Ultimately, is there a point where if things aren't being resolved, you get the superintendent or the board involved? I don't believe it's got to that level. So me, it just Ms. doesn't Barr. become that necessary. Yeah, go ahead. This is Miss Barr. Um, yeah, what we do is we, as Miss Mana indicated, we do request a more, a higher level or greater level of involvement from the community soup. For example, they have uh, assisted principals with corrective action plans and the community superintendents have monitored those corrective action plans and reported those results to us. If it's an ongoing situation, yes, um, that information is communicated regularly and routinely to the superintendent. We have not um, identified specific schools necessarily to the audit committee. Um, with respect to the, the follow up to the follow up to the follow up, those results as heard this evening are reported more generally and statistically um, to the full board. No, but we do report results to the audit committee, but we don't specifically or necessarily identify uh, the schools in that manner. OK, thank you. Miss Manna, my question was, you mentioned something about it. Did you say a P card or a P when you were talking about audits for I think you for schools in the future? Um, the school activity fund and procurement card audits. Perc that was so that's why you said P card was a procurement. Yes, audit. I'm sorry. They that's are OK. That's OK. I understood that once you, you as soon as you said that I understood it. Uh, is there a rotating schedule of there's 175 schools? Do you periodically does you know every three years you go through 30 schools or something like that? We do not have a rotation like that set up at this time, but we are working on risk assessments which could help us to get into a rotation. 
However, for the last, I'd say six to seven years, we've typically been doing them based on um, changes in principle. Um, and if there's been other concerns, we have we have done other SAF and procurement card audits at schools where there's been other high risk areas. So you're going to have a lot of work to do considering there's a lot of new principles coming in, correct? Well, we uh, going forward, we have not been doing the changes in principal audits unless they are a high risk. OK, thank you. Miss uh, Pastor, any questions? I, I do, I do, I do. Yes, please. Uh, I want to start with where you were, Mr. Um, McMillian. So unless the it, uh, school has been high risk, you don't do an audit at principal changes. I just want to say that I think audits at every principal's change is important to do, um, even if it hasn't shown high risk, um, or at least to have, or someone should tell as a little packet, this is, this is principal 101. Um, you might want to make sure that you sit down with your bookkeeper or someone in the school you think knows how things have been going because it can look smooth until it no longer looks smooth. And um, then maybe ask, I, 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 and that takes me into my question about the um, school activity funds. What kind of training happens or is it assumed that from one year to the next, there's someone who is speaking to whoever might be a sponsor or whatever about um, how you handle funds, what time money, any money collected should be turned in. Um, let's say grade level funds, how you only collect for those items that you for which you're going to actually pay. No extra funds, et cetera. Those are some of the kinds of things over the years I've seen um, become hiccups and I just want to know how people are supposed to know what kind of uh, uh, process or training happens for administrators even in a school where there have been no problems because again there are no problems until there are problems. Yes so the, the office of the controller specifically the there is a grants or a school activity funds office under there that handles all of the training. Now, new principals do have more um, intense training, and I believe it's broken out into uh, two different workshops for them, uh, along with um, the bookkeeping and fiscal positions as well. There is training that is offered through them ongoing, even for those that are not new. Um, and there is also sponsor trainings that they offer for, I believe it's, it's geared towards like class accounts for high schools, but it's also for any sponsor training. Um, and then each school is required to have their set of money handling procedures um, for specific for their school. And the school is required to do a training to the, the entire school every at the beginning of every school year. And that is a process that is assisted along with, uh, with the Office of Controllers helps with that where, where needed, where it's needed at each of the schools. Excellent, thank you. And, and before we go to Ms. Rose's question, I want to add as an athletic director, we went through that. Gail Peterson did a Correct. professional development with us uh, each August as athletic directors. And I used to joke, I'd heard it so many times, I asked if I could do it and they said no. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we, 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 we consistently were presented that information. Ms. Rowe, you had a question, please. So I just wanted to say that I agree with Ms. Pasture um, that doing audits in between each principal change is extremely important, but I have a slightly different reason for that. Depending on the time frame of the audit, you could have a principal come in and then maybe for whatever reason an audit happens the year after that and findings related to the previous principal implicate the current principal unfairly. And I think that when you do a change of principal audit, you're giving that new principal a clean slate and full knowledge of what things need to be changed. Because 
one of the things I've seen in these audits is that you may not have some big major thing that puts the person at risk, but there's little things. And those little things can add up and a new principal in a new school deserves to have all the information they can possibly get to give them the tools to do the best job they can and the audit lets them know where things need to be tightened up. And I would hate for, to have a principal in our school system take a new position, not have the information an audit would have given them. And then a year or two down the road during a routine audit, they're getting something that had they just known a couple years earlier or whatever, they could have fixed it and it wouldn't be on their professional shoulders. So that that's my take on that. I, I would really like to see us doing um, audits in between every principal change every time it happens. Ms. Barr, is there a way for the, when an incoming principal, a new principal comes in, is there a way to, to protect these people? So um, again, we're moving more towards the, the risk-based approach and risk-based model. And what we do through data analytics is we determine the need to do an audit, which is not to say that we don't do audits when there's change in principles, because we look at all the data, we look at the information, we communicate with the principals um, to let them know where there are risks at their schools. As far as protection of the principals, anytime that we would do a report of the previous administration, it's very clearly written in the beginning of the report that the audit is under the period or the period under review is for the former or prior principal and or administrative secretary or fiscal assistant. We make that very clear when those individuals were in charge of the finances so that what happens is with that report, it should be used as a tool for the incoming principal to say, and again, identifying risks where they maybe need to address their resources immediately in a particular area in order to be compliant over another area. So we do do that communication. We make it very clear that um, it is an audit of the previous administration and what areas need to be addressed. Now, what I'm hearing, and we can talk a little bit more when we get into the um, the approval of the FY22 and FY23 work plan, if we need to make adjustments to that or adjustments throughout the year. But again, there, there's a reason and rationale for what we're planning to do in FY22 and 23 with respect to um, identifying risk, conducting a risk assessment, and doing um, an overview of the internal controls because there really was not a lot of activity in school act in school activity funds this past year so we're going to use more of a data analytics and risk-based approach to focus the resources to where they really need to be does that make sense uh, it does. can i i want to jump in sure. because i'm not sure what miss Barr. i mean miss Barr. miss Rowe thought i I my reason was, but my reason was exactly what she articulated. Maybe I didn't say it well clearly enough, um, but I th I do think that incoming new principals, unless they have been the assistant principal in that same school, come in at a disadvantage um, without having the training, which yes does happen, but it's a far cry from the training to the reality and then going down the road um, and finding that there was something um, um, awry that had not reached the surface uh, and you have to just rely on your instincts to know it. Um, and, and, I, and, and I'm hoping that things have shifted, but I, I can clearly remember in one case having to just sort of muscle it down to say, I want an audit. I, 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 it's, it's my feeling, but I, I want an audit. Just some sort of something, where, no matter how quick and clean and dirty it might be, but it is critical for folks to have that up close and personal um, kind of discussion and overview. Unless, again, as I said, 
they were an administrator or someone of some authority in that particular school and might know the ins and outs. But I, 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 I would like us to just sort of roll this around and process this for new administrators to a school. Ms. Barr, I'm curious, when you mentioned data analytics, do you, does your department have the capability of looking internally at a school's books before, you know, something happens? Uh, if, if you saw something strange going on with a procurement card, do you, do you have that capability? If a, let's say a credit card was stolen from a school administrator and, and somebody was using it fraudulently, do you have the capabilities of overseeing that and seeing that ha as it, as, you know, being alerted and seeing it as it's happening? Our office does not, but the Office of Accounting does, and they'll often communicate that information um, to us. But we do have access to the data. We do have access to the JP Morgan system, which is the current um, procurement card system, and we, we do have direct access to that. So that's part, another part of what we're going to do is based on the information um, contained in that system, we can pull reports, we can analyze the data, we can, there's look fors, if you will, um, that, that we have planned uh, to do. And we'll look for red flags, we'll be able to see the types of purchases, the descriptions associated with the purchases, things of that nature. And if anything comes to our attention, we investigate it further. Again, the Office of Accounting also routinely and regularly looks at procurement card activity. And I know even for procurement card purchases in our own office that um, they've asked for documentation and we've had to submit the documentation to the Office of Accounting for their review just to make sure that we were compliant um, with, with the current procedures. So there's a lot of monitoring going on with respect to procurement cards and procurement card activity. But again, by taking a risk-based and data, ana data analytic approach, we can look at the bigger picture and look at more schools instead of looking at 10 or 20 or 30 change in principle. We can look at the entire system. And for example, um, Debbie worked on and completed a three-year cash analysis at all schools. And we identified schools where there were um, red flags, if you will. It didn't mean that there was necessarily something wrong at every single school. And then what we do is we go to the principal and or the fiscal assistant and say, OK, we've identified this huge balance or this huge change in activity um, in your account why and so we get explanations for that sometimes the explanations are acceptable and reasonable and sometimes they are not and we, when they are not and we feel that we need to do an audit or an investigation then we take that one step further so we did just do that um recently for for all schools and we also recently completed and conducted um reviews at, at the schools and offices with respect to procurement activity that occurred during the pandemic closure, just to make sure that um, there was a true need, instructional need for the materials purchased to identify and determine um, the location of the items purchased. So we went through all that um, already this year, but as we move into upcoming years, we'd like to continue to use and employ data analytics uh, more greatly in our audit approaches and and the risk-based approach. Ms. Barr, thank you very much. Ms. Mana, thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our second item is investigative unit statistics, and for that I call on Mr. Fletcher. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramillion. I will wait one second for presentation to pop up.
just to let the public know, Miss Pastor is going to leave the virtual piece and call in a little bit after five. Thank you, Mr. Wally. You're very welcome. Thank you for letting us know. Thank you, Mr. Corns. Um, so as you can see, uh, taking a look at the month of May uh, for our investigative unit update. Um, and during the month, we did receive 11 new cases. Uh, in this top chart here, you can see the breakdown uh, kind of spread throughout the various categories. Um, those 11 cases did bring us to 72 uh, for the fiscal year, so 11 out of 12 months. Um, I can tell you as of today, we are at 78. Uh, so we have received six new ones already so far this month. Um, and then that third chart, you can see the um, the year over year analysis uh, for the last three fiscal years, uh, FY19 through FY21. Um, and as we slide to our second page, uh, talk about the same 11 cases uh, that came in for May and, and 72 for the entire fiscal year. But now we're going to talk about them in terms of fraud, waste, and abuse uh, and how we categorize that. So for the 11 that came in, uh, you can see three are considered fraud, four were considered abuse, and then four were considered uh, non-fraud, waste, or abuse. Uh, second chart that shows us for the 72 total throughout the fiscal year, uh, the breakdown of those. Uh, so you can see 23 have been considered fraud, four waste, 14 abuse, and then 31 uh, are considered non-fraud waste or abuse. And then that third category, or I'm sorry, that third chart, that's our year-over-year -year analysis. Uh, and FY21, that is in purple. And you can see there, um, the breakdown um, in terms of fraud, waste, and abuse as compared to the prior fiscal years. And so, uh, Mr. Corns, I'm not seeing my page three um, on there. It looks like it's a two-page document. Um, so I can verbally talk through that. Uh, page three, that's where our um, we're going to show our closed cases. Um, and for the month of May, we actually closed 13 cases. Um, one was inconclusive uh, and then 12 were, were either management issues or, or something that was not investigated by our office. Uh, that brought our total to 76 for the entire fiscal year and of that 76, uh, nine had some level of substantiation uh, which was approximately 12 percent. 18 were unsubstantiated uh, which was 24 percent. 12 were considered inconclusive which was 16 percent and then 37 um, are considered management issues or not investigated, and that's approximately 49%. And that, Mr. McMillian, is the uh, presentation for our investigative unit for the month of May. Committee members, any questions? Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. Um, so I continue to be concerned with the fact that for the size of our organization and the number of staff we have, compared to like say county government, for instance, the amount of volume to our hotline and investigations that we're doing is extremely small. And I feel like that we need to take up at some point the issue of how are we advertising the hotline and how are we um, making sure that people know they can report these things because I feel like if they're not reporting it, either they feel like they're not safe to report it for confidentiality or retaliation, or they just don't know how and where to report something. So um, maybe we don't need to take this up in this agenda item, but as I see these reports, I continue to be concerned with the the low usage rate of the hotline for our, the size of our organization. Ms. Barr, any comments? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rowe, you are right that we are uh, below average in comparison to benchmarking um, other organizations of 
our size. And I just recently received a new benchmarking report and perhaps at our next meeting we can present uh, some of that information related to where we where we fit in, if you will. Um, in the past, advertisement has been um, through paychecks, you know, on the pay stub, you know, that that is there. It's on our website. It's on our purchase orders. Um, it's on the it's on the BCPS main website. So we are very open to suggestions and we're always researching other methods of communication to reach out to those um, individuals who have information or matters to report. Now, I think sometimes though too, people don't understand that our office handles fraud, waste and abuse and some of the information that we get in through the hotline as noted in the non-fraud, waste and abuse uh, category, Mr. Fletcher's statistics, they do um, either they're not investigated or they are handled by management because they truly are management issues and not matters of fraud, waste or abuse. So it does come down, I believe, like Ms. Rose said, to a matter of education, to a matter of advertising. And I can't stress enough that the anonymity that is involved with relation to um, the actual hotline itself. It is a third party administrator, um, Navex Global. It's located in a completely different state. It's 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, the way that we get notified that a report comes in is we get an email into our office. We do not know if the reporter chooses to remain anonymous. We truly do not know and we truly cannot find out who made that report. Um, so it is anonymous. I think what does happen though and what folks need to realize and understand is that as we conduct an audit or an investigation, we do talk to people and and as much as we stress confidentiality uh, throughout the process, we cannot stop people from talking to other people once the investigatory process or audit process has begun. So uh, and once you talk to one person, then you talk to the next person, then you talk to another person. And sometimes if it involves a whole department, people are going to figure out you know something's up and sometimes people have a suspicion of who they think may have reported um the allegation but we truly do not know unless they put their name and there is an opportunity to provide your name and contact information unless they put their name in there we truly do not know um who makes the allegations and we do everything to uh to protect confidentiality be because throughout the course of the investigation because we realize and I stress that these are people's lives, livelihoods and reputations. And when an allegation comes in, it's simply that it's an allegation. We don't have any evidence at the time that the allegation is made. So um, I'm not sure what else to communicate at this time, but again, open to suggestions and perhaps at a future meeting, I can bring benchmark information and between now and then we can research some more with respect to how to better advertise. Thank you very much, Ms. Barr. Ms. Pastor, any questions, comments? You're on mute, please. Ms. Pastor, you're on mute. I'm sorry, I'm trying that, to navigate coming from this to the phone. Uh, no, I have no questions. Thank okay, you. thank you. Mr. Fletcher, thank you very much for your report. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, prior to entertaining a motion to convene into administrative function, I'm going to announce the next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, September 21st, 2021 at 4.30 p.m. Uh, I would now entertain a motion to convene into administrative function session. Can I have a motion, please? So moved, Ms. Pastua. Second row. Outstanding. It has been properly moved and seconded that we convene an administrative function session to discuss committee operations. Ms. Jamison, will you please call the roll? Ms. Pastua? Present. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joes, absent. Thank you.
Thank you very much. We will now convene into administrative function. Thank you.